Our Lady Guadalupe is one of those stories that I wish I would appreciate more when I was younger. I love it now. And uh, it's a great, great source of inspiration. Before we go through some of the facts, because we already know some of those, we explain it. I want to start now the opposite way is why would you care about learning of Our Lady of Guadalupe? Why would you care about learning about, you know, this story that is seems to be exclusively of Mexico? Well, first of all, because it is the greatest evangelizer in the history of humanity. Literally, as Europe was being torn through the, you know, Protestant revolt, here a bunch of people were added to the church in 1531. It is without her probably Catholicism would not have taken root in the whole continent, to be honest. I mean, uh, that's how important it was. Um, and it's also the fulfillment of a prophecy, by the way, from um, uh, St. James. And I mentioned that before, you know, our later pillar. But that's for a different time, different story. But my point is, we are in an era that we're running against the grain, culturally speaking. We are uh, trying to evangelize, be witness of the faith. Well, maybe we can learn something about Our Lady and those circumstances where the Indians at that time were really having a hard time believing the gospel. So it took Our Lady, actually, to communicate and deliver the gospel to them. So we're going to see what lessons can uh, we can draw out of this amazing event. One of the things everybody talks about is the tilma, which is awesome. And for those of you who do not know what a tilma is, uh, spelled T-I-L-M-A, tilma, a tilma it used to be a, a, a clothing ornament, or garment, made out of uh, fibers of uh, maguey, or like a plant, in other words, because you can have, have cotton, which is very expensive. The tilma was actually out of a plant, and it was worn by usually, well, by the Aztecs, but usually at that time when the Spanish arrived, only the lower middle class people, especially the poor. It was basically as the cheapest thing you can get. And tilmas did not have a very long shell life, you know, because they're fibers and they will disintegrate fairly quickly in you know, maybe five years. Just think about it right now with a piece of clothing. You know, you wear jeans um, or a shirt. Um, how long would it last? You know, usually, well, maybe you have a shirt that is, you know, you had it for 20 years, assuming you haven't gotten fatter or whatever. It's like you can still wear it and it's still, you know, forming. I have. Um, it used to drive my wife crazy because I once had a piece of clothing that it was like 10 years and, and they still start tearing apart and I got rid of it. Well, with uh, the tilma, obviously it's less quality than that and it will disintegrate. It's just, you know, time does its thing. Well, Juan Diego is an indigenous convert to Catholicism and they gave him uh, the, the name of Juan, you know, baptismal name. And that's what I like to uh, also emphasize in this story. There's many angles you can look at it. This is the story of three Juans, essentially. Juan Diego, uh, which is the, the main character, Juan Bernardino, which is the uncle of Juan Diego, and Fray Juan de Sumarga, which is the bishop at that time in Mexico. Huh, how interesting. Uh, just like, you know, the gospel, uh, St. John, Juan, John in, in English. So um, they, uh, the tilma was Juan Diego was wearing. He was humble origins. This very important piece of history because um, before we go back to the original story, tilmas don't last. Tilmas don't last 50 years. Don't last 20 years. Don't last 50 years. Don't last 500 years. Okay? Just to make sure, or almost 500 years. Uh, that alone is mind blowing. Sorry, that alone is mind blowing when when you consider those facts. When you go to Mexico City and you can see that piece of clothing, and it's like, wow, this is incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. Just the fact that it survived alone. Forget about the image, which is incredible. Um, the fact that this thing is standing and not you know tearing apart is amazing. There are only essentially that I know of, and please correct me here in the chat if I'm mistaken. Two pieces of clothing i think maybe three i'm not sure but there's only a handful of pieces of clothing that have no human origin in that sense like the shroud of turin because that's where the lord was wrapped and the tilma is the other one where no i mean no man painted the tilma no man you know did the whole shroud of turin by hand i know that the enemies of the faith try to you know uh, discredit well that's on them i don't care I don't, i'm not looking at their approval i'm looking at the facts but uh that is mind-blowing if you ask me how could it be you know that this thing has not faded has not disappeared put any piece of clothing anywhere where the light hits 
Forget about sunlight, just regular light, and it's going to fade. It's going to deteriorate. We don't have that here, and it's just absolutely amazing. So Our Lady of Guadalupe, as you know, uh, there is, believe it or not, it's a connection between um, United States, Mexico, or now Mexico, originally was New Spain, because when this happened, it was uh, New Spain. And we here in America also have a claim into Our Lady Guadalupe. And not just here in America, you know, everywhere in the world, okay? So this is something we need to remember. It's not an exclusive sign of nationalism or anything. I know people might want to be tempted to use it that way, but that's not the case. Our Lady Guadalupe, just like anything, knows no borders, you know? It's, it's uh, you know, she's the empress, period, you know? So it's not exclusive uh, domain of you know Mexican people or Spanish people or whatever it is, you know, it's it's all for us. And it's for the reason, there's a specific reason she's here to point us to Christ. As I always say it, our lady's interest is for us to turn to Christ, for us to amend for our sins, to become better, to become lovers of God and anything that represents holiness and to seek that sainthood in this life so we can be in communion with God once we have to answer for our lives, in other words, once we die. So it's the same principle over and over, whether it's here, whether it's La Salette or Fatima, whatever it is, the interest is this loving mother that is bringing her children to Christ. It's always been the same thing. So Our Lady Guadalupe starts with Juan Diego, who's going, obviously, a mass is going late, and Our Lady appears to him and tells him to build a shrine in Tepeyac, this hill where this um, ancient, the Aztecs believe in that hill, um, Guatique, uh, the ancient goddess of the Aztecs, uh, used to uh, uh, give birth to Huitzilopochtli, this god of war in the Aztec mythology. She is also the one who, in the Aztec mythology, prophesied the end of the Aztec Empire at one point. And she's uh, used to wear, in the Aztec mythology, a dress or a skirt made out of snake remnants. Okay? So, she says, like, hey, tell the bishop to build a shrine. As you know, many of you heard, the bishop, Fray de Sumarrega, doesn't believe it. He's like, no way, you know, uh, I'm not buying this thing. Well, what was happening at that time, you know, in, in that decade of the 1520s, early 1530? When Spain conquered Mexico at the same time, you know, they're bringing all these Franciscans and all these, you know, priests to evangelize the whole area. The Indians were actually very depressed. Some of them dying of depression. Um, and if, some people will say, well, they were dying because of the, the labor. Not really. The Indians were used to working pretty hard. As a matter of fact, the emperor in the Aztec Empire could literally get fresh fish from Veracruz, which is in the Gulf Coast. Um, and the Indians were doing like a little, um, I forgot, a track. You know, they were like fishing it, bringing it fresh, and it will take just a few hours, and they were used to run and all that. Indians are pretty hard working. Um, so it's kind of an insult to them saying like, well, you're not used to hard work. That's not true. So what was going on really? In the Aztec mythology, um, not to get too deep into it, the Aztecs understood that they have to offer human sacrifice to ensure the dawn of a new day. I know it's kind of messed up, but then again, so was the Near Eastern society's understanding, so were the Canaanites. Anywhere else outside of the triune God, you're going to have a distorted understanding of theology and reality. The Aztecs were no exception. So they, okay, they, they thought, you know what, we need to ensure the uh, daily sacrifice. So um, we make sure there's a new dawn of a new day. So that's why they have so many rites and sacrifices. Well, here comes the Spanish and seize all the sacrifices. And the Aztecs or the Indians, culturally speaking, understood, A, this is the prophecy being fulfilled. B, the world's going to end. Uh, so what is going to, you know, what's going on? Well, they realized life went on, and there's a new day, and there's a new day, and life went on. And I don't know you, but I'm pretty sure that psychologically that must have been really hard for the Aztecs, knowing that their whole civilization was built upon lies, not because they were bad people or anything. It's just, again, they had not been exposed to the one true God. And essentially, they were wondering, well, what have we been doing all this time? You know, what, what's going on? And then we have to work, and now we like we, we don't like these Europeans or you know here you know these hairy Europeans. What the heck? You know, it's just it's overwhelming. 
And they lost in a certain way the lifestyle, but even though they gained rights, and even though the kings of Spain had granted them full rights, Spanish citizen rights and education, all these things, um, the nobility was still nobility and all that. It was just not gelling, and they were having a hard time getting along. Um, and the Spanish were forbidden. I'm not saying the Spanish behave incredibly well. Every single Spaniard, obviously not. There's a reason why they had laws punishing those who mistreated Indians. But they were not getting along, and they were dying. A lot of them getting depressed. You know, everybody's concerned. Plus diseases. Uh, like I mentioned last time, when two families get together, there's friction. Imagine two civilizations. Um, and when this happened with Juan Diego, and it's recorded uh, in Nahuatl, um, which is the original language of the Aztecs, the image alone, as we know, it already was communicating stuff to the Indians. But before we jump into that, as we know, Juan Diego is going to uh, Mass. Our Lady appears to him, goes to the bishop. The bishop doesn't believe, asks for a sign. And Our Lady says, all right. Uh, give, he asked for roses, so she gives him roses. As we know the story, Juan Diego picks from this hill those roses. Roses, by the way, uh, were out of season in Mexico, and not just in to make inter- the matters more interesting. The roses that Juan Diego showed to the Bishop Sumarraga were not just any roses you find here. There were Castilian roses, which obviously they're not native, especially at that time in Mexico. But a Spaniard will absolutely recognize that. You know, at that time. So when Juan Diego shows up uh, um, before the miracle, actually, uh, well, his uncle, Juan Diego's uncle, I'm sorry, uh, Juan Bernardino, I got a little lapsus there, um, gets sick. And instead of doing as Our Lady directed, he goes and tries to find a priest for last rites for his uncle, where Our Lady appears to him. And Juan Diego knows, obviously, uh, that he's not obeying Our Lady. And Our Lady very gently and kindly tells him, don't you worry. I'm paraphrasing, by the way. Um, and uh, uh, your uncle's going to be uh, uh, healed. And he was healed. So the next day, December 12th, is when Juan Diego goes and shows with the roses to the bishop. And as he brings the tilma, that, that little cloak um, full of roses, brings it and shows him, everybody's shocked. You know, the bishop and the witnesses and everybody, the city officials and all that. Um, that alone was an incredible miracle. As if that's not enough, and usually, obviously, with our Lord, you know, our Lord does everything incredibly well. Once the roses are falling there in front of the witnesses, then after that, the image of Our Lady that we know now and we see it nowadays appears in the cloak. As we see it right now, if you go to Mexico City. One of the things uh, that it's um, interesting about that also is if you notice in the image... Uh, of Our Lady Guadalupe, and I think I brought it up like when we talk about that in the series, the Catholic series of Spain. But anyway, you see that in the hands, the two colors, you see the white for the Spaniards and then the, the tan from the indigenous. The image, the original image, because they try to retouch it, I think back in last century, uh, to make it a little more uh, indigenous look. But actually the original image, which we have pictures of, by the way, is actually more Spanish Spaniard looking, not fully Spaniard than than what we see replicated nowadays in, uh, in different media. Now it doesn't matter. I mean, it's really, it's not about her race or her ethnicity. I mean, that would be falling into the trap of the modernists and the liberals and all that. But my point is, like, the Aztecs or the, well, the indigenous, not the Aztecs, the Indians understood is okay. Something's going on here. So they go and ask the uh, uh, the priests and bishops, you know, like. Uh, this is something that we we need some help explaining. And like, what do you mean? Well, this lady is pregnant. Yeah, you see that little you know uh, belt and cinta. She's pregnant. Yeah, but she's a virgin. Yes. How do you know it's a virgin? Because virgins wore her hair split in half like this. Married uh, women uh, or non-virgins, which at that time were synonymous, <laughs> um, wore little hair buns. I don't know how to explain it. I'm not good. I, mean, I can barely do a hair tie for my girls, obviously, let alone know about hairstyles. But basically, there were two little buns here. I uh, picked up their hair. It was not loose. Um, so they're like, she is not God, but she's pregnant with God. And the stars in her cloak are telling us that. 
the Aztecs had a very, you know, sophisticated concept of astronomy, by the way. And then they said, she's not God because she's praising God. If you notice in the image at the bottom on the skirt of Our Lady, one of the parts looks like a little slightly bent at knee. It was a dance. It's basically saying she's dancing, which is true. This is, by the way, where you see uh, the tradition of the uh, Matachines, the indigenous dancers in Mexico during this time of the year. Because the Aztecs, they praise God or the gods at that time for them, the mythology, um, through dances. You know, that's how they expressed it. Also, I mentioned that before. The flowers have a very important significance. Uh, the, the flowers meant uh, uh, legitimacy. You know, they meant business. So they declare war by sending flowers. This is a declaration of war. Here's a flower meaning I, I mean business because... In the Aztec concept or mythology, or even just understanding of life, anything that is rooted to the ground is actually must be true. You know, so it had roots. If you pull it from the ground, it's because it was true. So a flower is rooted from the ground is true. This is as close as we mean business. It's like a seal from the government for us nowadays. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's the same like a stamp. Well, for the Aztec, what that was the stamp. Um, so when they see all this, you know, symbolisms connected, they're like, this is incredible, mind blowing. Um, so obviously it makes sense. And then they, they I had it written down here. There's a lot of names that is going to be, uh, hard to, um, pronounce, which is okay. Um, and, um, one of the names that we have obviously for our lady is Guadalupe. You wonder why that name? Well, the original, it comes from the Aztec or Nahuatl term, Huatzlapeuc or Huatzalupe. It's like how phonetically it sounds. And it sounds similar to the Spanish word of Guadalupe. Guadalupe, originally, some of you know, come from Extremadura, Spain. A whole different story, too, by the way, which is connected to Our Lady Guadalupe. But it's actually the, the original name of Guadalupe comes from Spain, Extremadura. Uh, it's, um, it says that St. Luke um, did a little wooden sculpture of Our Lady. And as the Moors started conquering, they dug that and hid it, you know, and after the reconquest, they found it. A peasant, just like Juan Diego, by the way, a peasant found this uh, statue of Our Lady, La Virgen Morena, uh, in, uh, and it actually healed a town of uh, the seas and all that. Anyway, that's a beautiful story, by the way. So anyway, Guadalupe, it sounded the same, and they put the two together. It's like, yeah, Guadalupe. And also the most important part of this whole story is the name in Nahual. Huatzalsupe, okay? I'm sorry, I can't even pronounce it very well, uh, which is Guadalupe for us. The actually has a significance in, in, in Nahuatl, actually means the one who crushes the serpent or the one who made skirts out of uh, serpent skins, in other words. Basically, the one who crushes the serpent, which is obviously an incredible connection to the gospel, by the way. Uh, some of those links I'm going to post it here in the uh, in description of the video for those of you who want to read it. Um, I just didn't have the time this morning for the broadcast. But anyway, so it is incredible, all these connections. So the, the table was set for the Spanish to evangelize. Well, Our Lady had evangelized. You know, it's just this, everything else was just the Spanish just giving the terms and explaining all those things, right? And that's how about 8, 9 million of indigenous people actually converted to Catholicism within the span of 10 years. To put it in context, think of any evangelizing effort by any other place in the world or history of the nation, you know, how many have you evangelized that short amount of time? So many new people, especially people who are enemies. I mean, you know, honestly, Our Lady Guadalupe is the origin of what we know nowadays as Mexican culture. Again, it's not in my um, uh, learnings. More than Mexican culture, which obviously it, it does exist, it's actually a Hispanic culture, and it's great. Um, but that's actually the origin of the Hispanic uh, culture here in America, because right? uh, it has its own distinct flavor, and that's what it was, because it's the union of two civilizations. Any other attempt has been met with a lot of resistance and violence, and is one side imposing the other and oppressing the other. This is the only time where you have a marriage, a new civilization, a new life, and men could not accomplish that. It could only be through the hand of Our Lady. And this is what you have till this day. It is one of, it's, I think it's the third most visited shrine in the world. Uh, and, and it's a very important site. Even non-believers actually have been touched and impacted by that shrine. 
it is associated nowadays with uh, a lot of with the Mexican identity. It's changing lately, obviously, because we're starting to learn more and more. And obviously, it's not exclusively Mexican. It just happened to be in a place that nowadays happens to be Mexico. Okay, so uh, uh, is there's a lot of things so, for us that we can learn and take advantage. Run one more thing. One more thing before I go to the comments, because uh, I know I'm getting you know, filled up with comments. Woo, that's good. That's good. Um, so what's the connection here in America? Well, in 1910, St. Pius X named uh, Our Lady a patroness, patroness sorry, of Latin America. But in 1945, actually bishops from the U.S. and Canada, get that, uh, urged uh, Pius XII to bestow her the title of Empress of the Americas, the whole continent. So when you hear things like, well, that's only for Mexicans, which, by the way, again, is nonsense. Uh, it, it, here you can prove it, actually, with uh, facts from the Holy See itself, you know, it's, it's for everybody, and there's a lot for us to learn, a lot to be thankful, uh, and nowadays, particularly, is something that we should cling to a lot. All right, that's our story of Lady Guadalupe. Uh, remember three Juanes, or three Johns, in this story, uh, Juan Diego, Juan Bernardino, which is Juan Diego's uncle, and Juan de Sumarga. By the way, Our Lady, even though the bishop was showing incredible origin at the beginning, uh, incredulity or skepticism, whatever you want to call it, Our Lady encouraged Juan Diego to listen to the indications of the bishop, okay? So just beware when sometimes when you hear apparitions that they're trying to uh, put you against the church and all that, uh, just to put it in context. Mm -hmm.